Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Long. The Indiana General Assembly really accomplished quite a lot this year, but perhaps it was overshadowed by the process. A Republican Senate, a divided House, a Democratic governor, sexy news when it comes to legislative reporting. That made the headlines. Today on Public Affairs Roundtable, we'll talk some about the process, but we'll also talk about those things that were done and some that were not done. Our panelists are Pat Kiley, a Republican from Anderson, co-chairman of the Ways and Means uh, Committee in the House, State Rep. Hurley Goodall, a Democrat from Muncie, Mark Carmichael, another Muncie Democrat, and John Rouse, our producer and a member of the political science faculty at Ball State University. John, we talked about, I talked about the process, and that seems to be a big focus of this session. Uh, is, is that important, is that people look at how laws were made and not just what came of it? Well, I think everything in our society in the 1990s is process. So it's, it's not what comes out of the process, in a sense. Or the pro it is important what comes out of the process, but the result is the process. So process in our society, whether it's due process, process is, is very important. Now, I don't think very much came out of this session. I think the most important thing in terms of this session was that, in terms of what happened, was what didn't happen. And that was that collective bargaining did not come out for public sector employees and the abortion legislation failed as, as well. So I think this session is known, as you say, for process, and also, number two, for what did not happen. What do you think, Pat? Did you accomplish a lot or not? Well, I think we had some, some accomplishments. I don't know if you'd call it a major short session. Um, the process was bogged down, I think, sometimes for, for all the wrong reasons. I mean, the auto excise cut got to be such an overblown issue, I thought, uh, in the governor's response that it literally for a week in the house almost shut the place down. I was a little wondering about why it should have occurred on, on an issue that I think had some public appeal, but it wasn't the kind of thing that was going to make or break the session. I think you had to look at uh, by party and I think almost by caucus what each caucus tried uh, to accomplish versus what I think uh, the governor tried to accomplish and then kind of dissect the session from that standpoint because uh, the the mix of who was getting along with who at different parts of the session uh, was probably the most interesting part of the process as far as I was concerned. Uh, I think that the House Democrat caucus was closely aligned with the governor. You couldn't find the, the, the Senate Democratic caucus anywhere near where the House Democratic caucus were, and I think maybe the House Republicans were agreeing on a lot of things that the Senate Democrats were agreeing on, and I think in a lot of ways uh, some Senate Republicans uh, saved the governor particularly on collective bargaining. So it was really kind of a mismatch of, of different groups going together for different coalitions throughout the session. Curly, your co-speaker, Mike Phillips, said that uh, people don't care what the process is like. They just want to see the results. Do you agree with that? I think to a certain degree he's right, and I agree with Pat. Uh, it was a very frustrating session. I know the last day we were there, I felt a great deal of frustration, but since I've gotten home, and have been able to really look at what we were able to accomplish and things that came out, considering the magne magnitude of the issues that we were faced with. You know, we, this was a short session that's really supposed to be kind of a cleanup session. We ended up with issues like collective bargaining, abortion, casino gambling, uh, the excise tax cut, which are really major issues that we had to deal with in a short session. And I think the fact that we were able to add a substantial additional funding to education in an off-budget year for the first time in my tenure in the General Assembly was a major accomplishment. I think, Mark, that, that an accomplishment sometimes is something the legislature does not do. Uh, some people would see the failure of collective bargaining for public employees to be an accomplishment. Some people would see the legislature's failure to act on abortion to be an accomplishment. Uh, how do you see the session? Well, I, uh, I think that we did accomplish quite a bit. Um, when we were embroiled in the process, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to pick out those accomplishments. But uh, I spent a lot of time in the last few weeks on environmental issues. And we made uh, some additional good strides uh, in the environment in Indiana. And that was critical. Uh, I think that uh, the 90s, not only in the state of Indiana, but across the country, is going to be the decade of the environment. I think we got a handle on that in Indiana this year. 
Uh, granted, the three issues that captured the imagination of the public and of the press going into the session uh, were abortion, uh, collective bargaining for state employees, and possibly casino gambling for the city of Gary. Those three issues dominated a lot of our time um, and caused us then to, to deal with other issues and maybe not the time that we'd like to have. One of the problems of the short session is that we do a lot in a very small period of time. And it does lend itself to being kind of a, a chaotic atmosphere. Pat's exactly right that we had four caucuses uh, going in four different directions. The governor and the administration makes a fifth group, uh, which was another direction. Um, it all comes crashing together in the last few days, and it's hard to keep track of all of the good things that are happening in addition to all of the posturing, all of the uh, press conferences being called, all of the credit taking and the blame giving. Um, but it does work, and I think as we look back, as Hurley said, uh, we accomplished quite a bit. You know, I think it's important to talk about the process because the big process we're looking at is November. And everything that occurred in this past session goes to that process because it's so very important because the congressional districts are going to be drawn, the state legislative districts are going to be drawn, and so the word process is very important, and what you fellows did in the session relates to that. Now, the real issue, as I look at the 1990s, getting back to abortion, getting back to casino gambling, getting back to collected bargaining, is what is going to be the role of government. And we're paring down the role of government to basically two things, as I see it, education and transportation. But beyond that, the, the part of the problem in terms of the fact that nobody agreed is that there's real concern out there as to what are the limits and what should government do. Well, what should government do, especially in an election year of this magnitude? I mean, it's a situation where I think that many times we were just paralyzed by the, the, uh, the high stakes being played in November of 1990. Well, I, and I think the overriding argument in, in the process is, in, and it seems that, and it seems to me, and, and it's been this way, I think, for a long time, it's getting very hard, and I think it, particularly in Indiana, for, for the public to, to really tell a major difference between the two parties. And I think this session, uh, I'm not real sure abortion's not going to tell you that, in my estimation. I'm not even sure collective bargaining would, because collective bargaining passed the House with 64, 65 votes. So it's pretty hard for labor to come into the House and say it was strictly a Republican-Democrat issue. Now, it got locked up with some Republicans in the Senate. I think the question, and it deals with a process, I think it's the one that the public has to deal with, is, is who can deliver the promises? I mean, who, who can separate performance and, uh, versus promises? And I think we saw a lot of that uh, in the last couple of years. I mean, the collective bargaining issue, to me, was, was a classic example of an issue that was totally botched from the beginning. Uh, the governor asked the labor community to go with a one-year delay, which they granted him, I think, begrudgingly, uh, to hire a consultant. And I was talking to the governor two weeks before the session. He couldn't even give me a draft of the bill. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I asked him if, if, uh, if, uh, if a professor was included in his bill, and he said no. I said, well, how about a, a janitor at a university? And the governor couldn't answer that question, nor could his key legislative aide. So I think collective bargaining got lost, never had a chance. I don't think it had a fair chance from the time it hit Labor Committee because uh, there were such great differences at that point between the labor organizations and what they have to live with politically with their people and what the governor was willing to accept uh, as he related the consequences of, of the collective bargaining issue to his political career. Does the governor have to t share some of the blame here, Hurley? Well, I think probably uh, in some instances, I, I appreciate Pat's, you know, partisan comments, but <laughs> in, in reality, we had a governor that was dealing with a legislature controlled by the opposite political party who could play any kind of games and do whatever they wanted to do, and they did that with the legislation, particularly in the Senate. And uh, I think we have to recognize that we have a governor that does not have a legislature that's controlled by his party, which complicates his ability to initiate his program, whatever that program might be. Particularly when his program's not clear. Well, <laughs> that's a matter of degree. Maybe he just didn't want to tell you what his program was. Well, was it, I mean, that's, that's part of the problem. You've got to talk to the legislature before you can convince them. Was there, was there anything really that happened this session that's going to affect the election in November? I mean, you talk a little bit about 
collective bargaining, and depending on what spin you put on it, it's, it can be a Republican issue to your extent, a Democratic issue to yours, Hurley. Well, I don't think the legislature itself will will make some determination, but I think issues such as the abortion issue, as Mark has pointed out several times, really none of us have run with that issue being one of the major campaign issues. This election, people are going to have to stand up and be counted on that issue one way or the other, and no one knows how it's going to play out in the state of Indiana as far as votes are concerned. I think to a lesser degree, the issue of casinos and collective bargaining were not really a part of our election two years ago when we ran. Those were not burning issues, but those will be on the minds, particularly of, of public employees who want to know how legislators are going to vote on that issue in 1991. Uh, the people who are interested in the abortion issue will do the same, and to a lesser degree, uh, the casino issue will be debated in this election. We're going to get more single-issue voters uh, this November? Well, you know, from a uh, from my point of view, and I don't know how Pat and Hurley feel about it, but single-issue voters are are the groups that you really can't spend too much time on as a as an elected official or as a politician running for re-election. Uh, if they're going to vote. Uh, one way or the other on a single issue, then if we have taken a stance on that issue, you might as well move on mm -hmm. to the larger group of people in the middle of that spectrum that you can appeal to based on what you believe you accomplished individually as a legislator and based on what you think the, the legislature accomplished uh, during the last session. Um, and I think that we're moving to the point now, especially in the state legislative races, where it's pretty much the individual legislator versus his or her challenger uh, party labels are, as Pat said, it's hard to tell the players without a scorecard anymore. Um, governor Evan Bayh may be the most conservative governor that this state has had in a long time, and he's a Democrat. So that just kind of throws all the rules out the window. So I think that we're back down now as, as candidates now facing 1990, stressing what we've accomplished as individuals and what the legislature accomplished in general. And then there are some legislators who are Republicans or Democrats and move back and forth. Move back and forth, and you, can't, <laughs> you really can't tell the players anymore without a scorecard. Well, does this not say that political parties in our state, Indiana, the, <clears throat> the great state that focuses upon having an election every three out of four years, the state of political parties, does this not say in so many words that political parties as we've known them in the past, are they not going by the wayside? Or, or if, if they're not going by the wayside, how are they going to change? Well, I, I just think that their, their role is diminished somewhat at the state legislative level. Now, when you get back down to the, to the county races in each individual county, uh, I think that the, the local party has a lot to do with the success of not only fielding a slate of candidates then, but getting, getting people registered to vote, getting them out to vote on election day. But, but I just feel as I look around the state and at other legislators that it's really the quality of the individual candidate now that kind of transcends that party label. Well, I agree. And I, I think it, there is a problem with the parties dominating. I think it's to the detriment of the public, really, because as each person becomes more independent in how they act in the political arena, there's no uh, group accountability. You know, who do you hold responsible? You know, you're trying to deal with a hundred different people in the House of Representatives trying to develop a consensus, and neither political party accepts responsibility for what happens or what does not happen. So I think it's essential that we have a strong two-party system, not only in this country, but in this state and locally, and I would hate to see those parties uh, diminished any more than they already are. Yeah, I think Congress is a great example of uh, the kingdom of populism, where you analyze your district and you run basically on what you think those important issues. And I mean, it's very difficult for for the uh, the Democratic Party, even with vast majorities in, in in the House of Representatives, to to push forward agendas. And I think that's simply because that there's that dilution not only nationally, but uh, in the 12 years I've been in the House. Uh, We've moved from, I think, a very kind of tight two-party system in that period of time with the destruction of patronage and a lot of other things to a, a lot of people who could care less about long-term agendas as to the direction of the state, uh, as example, education programs or, or construction or highway finance, some of the things that you do have to raise taxes for every once in a while because of uh, 
revenue drops and some of those other things, you do, it's very hard to get across the long-term agenda in, in the Indiana General Assembly. And I think that's probably the most dramatic change. And it is because of the, the dilution of the party. I mean, there was a day in 1975 that you could call the, a legislator's county chairman and say, hey, we need a vote out of this guy to promote this program because we think it's good for the, for the state. And you do that today, I mean, people just laugh at you most of the time. They go, well, my county chairman hadn't done anything for me for 10 years. What do I care what you call him or not? And I think that's happened. I, I think yeah, that we all pretty much have been on our own from a party standpoint for so long that, that everybody kind of does their own thing. Well, well, if I could follow up with a question, what, what does the Democratic Party in Indiana stand for? What does the Republican Party in Indiana stand for? How are they different? How are they different? <laughs> Well, I don't think that we know that yet. I think that because of our dominance for so long um, in the state of Indiana, that the public only saw one agenda. And, and I think what happened to the Republican Party is that because we thought we were going to be there forever, we kind of tried to adopt everybody's agenda. I mean, we were out on education and economic development and human services, and, and we were doing a lot of things on a very broad front. Uh, I think the governor, Evan Bayh, did a very good job of coming back in and, and picking off a couple issues and getting in office. Now the question will be, you know, does, does Evan Bayh push the, the Democratic Party, which I, I guess I read over the weekend, he, he's trying to move the Democratic Party nationally more to a conservative bent, which if he can do that, he really will, will be a savior. I, I don't know whether they have much luck there or not, but... Uh, I think you'll see that more defined. I think we tried to, to, to make up some of those differences this session, but I think we're in a, in a process where, for the first time, you have competition between parties that, that agendas are going to mean something, and I think even party platforms this summer will, will try to pick up on those differences. But I still think we're in, in kind of an evolutionary process at, at this point. I, I think Pat's right, basically, and I think really... Both parties rhetorically, you know, the Republicans will say they're for less government interference in their lives, but actions don't match it. The Democrats say they're for the minorities and for the women, for the senior citizen, the workers, and a lot of times their actions don't match it. So it's a lot of rhetoric that's not matched by real action, and I think both parties are kind of floundering in their basic philosophies right now. Is there a difference between Indiana Republican and Indiana Democrat, Mark? Not much. Um, not when you get to the Indiana legislature. And uh, I guess I don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, I, I'm not as, as firm a believer in that uh, as Hurley, possibly, in the, in the strong two-party system. Uh, I think that, that all 150 legislators that I, that I know, uh, or the other 149, are just simply trying to do the best job they can for the state of Indiana. We don't all agree uh, but we don't even agree within our own caucus what's the best direction for the state of Indiana. So um, I just think that, again, that at least at the state legislative level, that these races are going to be run one-on-one -on -one between the two candidates in November, whoever they are. Uh, the incumbent is going to be stressing his or her accomplishments. Uh, the opponent is going to be attacking the shortcomings that they see. Uh, and I think party labels are continue to, are going to mesh. When you talk about education or economic development or social services, roads and transportation, to me, I don't see one party standing for two or three of those items and the other party standing for the other. I see them all meshing. I mean, they all have to be there. You have to have economic development. You have to have infrastructure. You have to have a good uh, education system. You have to have good social services. Um, it just seems to me that, uh, that it all blends and the process forces it to blend and the labels are disappearing. Well, perhaps this says in a way that things are really pretty good in Indiana because apparently nobody's in charge. So if nobody's <laughs> in charge, perhaps the people of Indiana are in charge. And, and, and so the only thing that we can hope as Hoosiers is that the people of Indiana have opportunities in terms of that infrastructure, education, transportation, capitalism, learning, being able to compete. And so maybe we're saying in a way that nobody's in charge and so that means that maybe the citizen is in charge? No, I disagree. Okay. I think the reason we have such apathy in the elections is because people can't tell Tweedledum from Tweedledee. And I think in the long run, it will be bad for our country and for our state if we don't maintain a strong two-party system where people have choices. That's what elections are all about. 
How can people change public policy if they have to select amongst a hundred different legislators and hope that when they come together, 51 of them will present the agenda that they believe in? I, I just think it's essential that, that we come back to a strong two-party philosophy if we're going to generate the interest and do away with the apathy and the general electric. I think most people, they are turned off now because they don't see where it's going to make any difference who they vote for. Both Republicans and Democrats would like to have been one member stronger during the, in the House, anyway, this last session. Uh, if it did work, we talked about uh, the environment. Uh, what else did, was accomplished, Pat, that uh, you saw as, as important in the session? Well, I had the auto excise tax bill. I pretty much worked on it for six to eight months, and uh, I think that gave uh, some, some relief in an area that, that was long overdue, and I think it's one of those issues that that will start separating the parties a little bit i think that we probably historically got out of line as republicans as and and the governor used it very well as as raising taxes now he, he's happy we did that now because he has one of the largest surpluses in the country but yet uh, i think that it got us a little bit out of whack as to the traditional kind of republican voters that have kept us in power uh, the environmental area, I think the, I think the supplemental budget finally in the end was, was all you could expect in the kind of environment we had to deal with. Uh, we got a severe correctional problem, and I think that uh, that bill uh, went a long way uh, to deal with that. Uh, we did add some additional money for education. Everybody says it, it, it's a great thing in a short session. We did that. Well, the reason is that the, the biennial budget has the, the lowest numbers for education in, in several years. So I think it's now bringing us back to, to at least trying to keep a level funding area in education or, and trying to keep the increases that I think we've been striving for in the 80s. Um, I think some of the things as far as our side was concerned, and, and the new Kirk switch was probably the most interesting political kind of scientist action of the session, were a party that is not in power, that does not have the governor, has somebody switched. Now, a lot of people came to us and said, would you offer him? I said, <laughs> I said, we didn't offer him anything. I said, he was driven away. And, and that you now gives us... Stand on your head and flag cars <laughs> with your feet out in the middle of McKinley Avenue. <laughs> and and that, that gave us a majority, but probably the most unusual political process of the whole thing is after that occurred, you actually had a minority speaker in the state of Indiana that led to a lot of the gridlock after the switch. And the reason being is that, I mean, if you're the minority speaker, all you can do in this case is be blind in your right eye because you can't hold a point of rule, you can't uphold the rule. We could, I mean, we could vote down anything. So that, that led to probably one of the most interesting historical kind of political processes that you'll ever see. So it, it, we had a little bit of everything. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, well, you know, well, in, 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 a, in a sense, it gets back to the first point we made on the program, and that's pro the process saved us. Because with all this chaos with, uh, let's see, it was uh, about 50-50 in the House when it started, yeah. and then it was 26-24 in the Senate. So really, you know, we talk a lot we, in terms of process, and process is kind of bad, but, but process did save us. Well, let me get off process and ask you this question. How did the governor do? How, how, would, you, how would you rate the governor in this session? Well, I think he did much better this time than he did last year, his first year, and I think that is because of the time he had to study, the more understanding he had of the legislature. I think he did get a few more advisors that had legislative experience uh, that helped him. But getting back to what Pat said about the change in the numbers in the General Assembly, you have to understand that in November 1988, when we reorganized and the agreement that was made that created the two speakers, was based on that 50-50 balance. Once that 50-50 balance was gone, you know, had that agreement not been in place, there would have been true chaos in that place. So I think in that situation, the process that developed that agreement and it could not be changed except by, I think it was a two-thirds vote, was that right, Pat? Really kept the system locked in place that allowed us to at least get through the process and come out in, in as good a shape as we did. Uh, had that agreement not been in place and not being able to be disturbed by that one defection, that you know, that would have been a disaster in, in the General Assembly. Did Governor Biden do better this session, Pat? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I hate to get into these so-called rating arguments, and I, and I have to deal with uh, 
how the governor and I think his legislative aides a approached me in, in the dealings that I, that I had to work on, and I was closely associated with the budget and, and the auto excise tax cuts and a lot of other things. I think that the governor had a major step backwards in, in, in his relationship with the legislature, not maybe necessarily directly with the governor, but with uh, a few people that he sends upstairs. I think if the governor does not make some major changes in, in some of the people that represent him on third floor, uh, that he's going to have some real problems in, in the next few years. And I, and I could tell that not only in our caucus, but, but late in the session, even the last night when I had to call a meeting in the budget director's office to get everybody together to put a budget together because it had fallen apart, you could tell that, that the communication just were not there. And so uh, I think the governor came out on top simply because he has a way of doing that and because, you know, a few people jumped in and, and helped at the, at the last moment. But I hope that the governor learned something. I mean, everybody says here that, that you know, that uh, it was difficult for the governor to do anything because of uh, of a 50-50 split and a Republican majority in the Senate. Well, if I was governor, then I'd be talking to Republicans as well as Democrats throughout the session. I know in the case of our speaker, uh, the first time he met with the governor was in the last uh, two days of the session. First time that we, we were ever approached uh, in any fashion by the governor to, to talk about any of the programs. And I think it's very important. Uh, the governor has to lead a statewide agenda. As legislators, we, we lead, we're down at the district level, and if there's no... If there's nobody at the top looking at the big picture and promoting that, then, then you're going to have what you talk about, kind of a, uh, the citizens are winning, but really are they over a long-term basis? And I don't think they, they do that. I, the governor's got to, I mean, the governor's been in for two years. I think he's going to have to get out front on, a, on a, the next session in a legislative package. He's going to have to be a lot better uh, in dealing with that. Because either way, he's not going to have a great majority one way or the other. Does that criticism come, Mark, because the governor was inexperienced or because the governor dared to do something different, to be a different kind of governor? Well, I think there's a lot of criticism leveled at the governor and his staff that probably wouldn't have been leveled if, if, uh, if we hadn't been in a 50-50 tie where there's no room for error. Uh, other governors have had the luxury of having a, uh, a majority party where you can be a little sloppy. You can kind of you can get away with some things because your party has the votes to ramrod through whatever whatever you want to get done. And this governor, uh, not only was he brand new, but um, he had the uh, unique situation of a 50-50 split where there's just no room for error. And uh, and I think they're getting better. I know I did better this year than last. I didn't have anything vetoed. Our so, situation uh, is we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Pat Kiley, Hurley Good, or Mark Carmichael, John Rouse for being with us today. I'm Larry Law. See you next week on Public Affairs Roundtable. Public Affairs Roundtable is produced in the studios of WIPB Channel 49 on the campus of Ball State University. The producer is John Rouse. Listener comments are welcome.